Hello, everyone. Uh, I think I just said hello, but I was muted. Uh, this is Pasquale Napolitano. I'm the stormwater maintenance specialist uh, at Hydro International. Uh, I'll be doing this uh, BMP maintenance webinar titled What's Working and What Needs Work. And uh, I think some people are still kind of coming in, but we'll, we'll get started now. Okay. Um, so about Hydro International, uh, 30 plus years of experience uh, engineering structural BMPs to treat stormwater. Uh, we have an in-house hydraulics laboratory uh, shown here. Uh, we have thousands of separator and stormwater filter installs across the globe. Uh, and we're also a maintenance service provider. So uh, we deal with uh, a lot of approval agencies, regulatory agencies, specifying municipal engineers, contractors, uh, and end users. So we kind of uh, uh, have a lot of touches with all the different uh, vested parties in um, stormwater BMPs. Introduction to me, uh, again, my name is Pasquale. Uh, I've done a, a sort of iteration of this uh, type of webinar on maintenance the past few years. Here's some, uh, some past places I've done this. Um, it's been evolving every year. Uh, I will be doing this again in August in both Minneapolis and in Atlanta. Uh, if any of you are in those areas, I encourage you to come. Uh, so what's uh, a little bit of an overview here of, of what we'll be talking about. Uh, here's a, a, a picture of a catch basin cleaning uh, using uh, the, the, the pressure wash to fluidize the sump and break up the sediments. But we'll look at some maintenance myths. Uh, then what the issue is, uh, which is that Routine maintenance is not occurring uh, because routine inspections are not occurring. Uh, then we're gonna look at some things that are actually working and some things that, uh, whether you're a municipal uh, engineer or regulator or uh, specifying the private engineer that you can do to, to help. And those things include uh, educating and empowering owners, of course. Uh, help from the private sector is, is a key component that includes uh, third party inspections and maintenance of structures, um, as well as automation and data logging uh, and compliance and reporting software assistance. Uh, and then throughout this, what I'll be doing is sprinkling uh, in photos and uh, field examples uh, that we've come across. I'm a very visual person, so uh, try not to put a lot of copy on here, but do try to put in images so you can sort of see the things we see daily out in the field from a maintenance perspective. So let's jump into the maintenance myths. Um, so one of the myths is that it's better to uh, oversize a treatment system so they can go longer without maintenance. Uh, the fact to this is that larger systems uh, can actually be more expensive to clean out, uh, particularly if it hasn't been serviced in years, uh, just because it's a larger diameter structure or something along those lines uh, does not mean uh, that it's easier to clean. And here's a, a photo of a, a unit that uh, when uh, quite a few years without being cleaned, um, that can actually increase the capital cost uh, or, or the cost overall to maintain a system like this once they've become this full, uh, you pop the manhole cover and it's you know, about six inches away from uh, dirt. Another myth that some treatment systems can go years without maintenance. Uh, it's a rare exception. Uh, obviously some systems are designed for this, uh, LID systems, um, Detention structures are designed uh, with this in mind, but, but the truth is if you're not actually inspecting and at least doing some, some good housekeeping or minimal maintenance, it's not really the case. It doesn't matter if it's a manufactured treatment device uh, or non-proprietary device or green system. Uh, no maintenance at all for a year or two, that's, that's a big myth. Uh, and here we have a uh, corrugated uh, uh, metal piping underground detention structure. And, and keep this in mind, I'll actually circle back to this site uh, in a few slides but it doesn't look like there's much sediment there. That's actually less than a year of activity, but uh, it gets worse. Uh, and here's another view from a different uh, row in that same structure. Uh, another myth, uh, some storm water treatment devices have self-cleaning screens, not necessarily limited to screens, but other functions. Um, it, screens are particularly blind. They're very good for stopping uh, gross pollutants like organics, like leaves and things, trash, wrappers. Um, but uh, it's not always the case that they're going to self-clean. Um, so, you know, here's a, a screening uh, of, a, of a device and you can see there with organics only, it's, it's blinded. So you do need to clean, uh, they won't clean themselves. 
Another myth uh, that some manufactured treatment systems can't be maintained. Um, if you're a specifying engineer or maybe you're a, a municipal engineer and, and you have uh, different contractors or manufacturers trying to come and approach saying to, to use a particular unit, um, you know, there can always be the issue of, well, is this, can you even maintain this structure? There's a lot of time and money and effort that goes into the approvals process. And I assure you that no matter the manufacturer, if they've made it through uh, one of those approval agencies, they can be cleaned uh, to some extent. Uh, now, obviously, more frequent and routine maintenance uh, means less confined space entry, uh, less work, less time, less manpower to clean these systems. Uh, but in the end, yes, these systems can be cleaned. Uh, here's a dirty system compared to a clean system, just to give you uh, a visual idea. Not specific to this case, though. But uh, And then finally, uh, manufactured systems should be sized based on their sump depth. Uh, you know, that's kind of goes back to the first point. Um, they don't need to be based on, on that. They should be based on other things, water quality flow, uh, you know, what they're trying to treat, things like that. Not necessarily storage capacity. That can be added, but it shouldn't be a standalone uh, reason. Uh, oversizing units it doesn't extend the maintenance intervals, as mentioned in the first myth. Um, and particularly, we see this actually in some cold climates where they want to um, extend the, the sump depths or make larger diameter structures. Uh, and they think that that will hold off uh, need to do maintenance as frequently. That's wrong, actually, um, because especially in cold uh, weather places, you will have road sand and salts that go down, increases sediment levels. Uh, these types of materials can get hard like concrete if you don't clean them uh, roughly annually, uh, as suggested. And if they're very deep, uh, it makes it even harder to access and to fluidize uh, the sumps, similar to that first image I had showed of a uh, catch basin being cleaned. So uh, this is a big one that I, I, I try advocating and, and, and educating people on. Uh, don't make systems deep or, or large around uh, to, to curtail maintenance. It just it won't work. You're going to make life more difficult. Uh, and you know, here's an example of a cold weather place with a unit. Um, so what's the issue here with, with um, structures and these maintenance not occurring? Uh, maintenance isn't occurring, and uh, you, know, you can see here, corrugated metal piping structure again, uh, a lot of trash in there. Uh, that's just from a year, uh, excuse me, 18 months after the previous cleaning. So these things can, can add up pretty quick. There's a, a what is supposed to be a dry detention basin on the right. Um, you can see trash there accumulating as well. Uh, but you can't tell from that photo is that from the outside, you wouldn't even know there was something there. Uh, so we know that structures aren't being cleaned. How do we know this? Uh, as a manufacturer, we ran some numbers um, based on our filter system, the upflow filter. Um, we looked at how many installations we have. Uh, these have uh, filter packs that need to be replaced. Uh, as any filter structure, filter media needs to be swapped out. And we looked at how often that's happening to specific sites. Um, we gauge that uh, about 5% of sites are actually switching out their media uh, as they should. This number has been going up. Uh, the maintenance group here, we've been doing a lot of work trying to educate owners of how stormwater filters work. Uh, and that's been helping. But the visual I want to add to this is uh, here's how one of these structures looks at installation. Here's how it uh, would look after, say, 18 months of service. See some organics there, a little bit of hydrocarbon sheen. Uh, looks like it's ready to be cleaned, obviously. And here's one after 36 months, uh, uh, poor erosion control, practice on site, uh, and the dirt is uh, filled all the way up to the tops of these filters. Uh, you don't have to be particularly familiar with this filter structure and how it works, just to know that uh, there's a sump below that. Uh, so the tops where that dirt is on the right, it's about three feet down from there. So it's just filled up with dirt and obviously not doing what it should. So it doesn't take long for systems to stop working, is the point. Uh, why? Is operational maintenance not occurring? Uh, it's not occurring, as I mentioned in the, the intro, because routine inspections uh, and reporting aren't occurring as much as they should. Uh, so here's some examples here. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, what's a, a bioinfiltration system on a protected watershed uh, filled with trash. No one knows it's there other than you know maybe an engineer or somebody who would know what these things are, uh, and it's sort of left to the wayside. Yeah. Find it ironic that no spraying, uh, it's filled with trash. On the right side is a catch basin that's completely filled um, with material and trash. Uh, it's a graded inlet, so it, it's you can't even access the unit. Now, you know, of course, maybe street sweeping will clean that up, but that doesn't mean that they've cleaned up the catch basin. 
um, you know, the owner of this site uh, said that they had already cleaned up their basins and didn't need to do anything. Um, and, you know, it's not uncommon sometimes for financial reasons, owners, particularly of uh, large commercial structures to, uh, you know, say things are taken care of. And if, you know, they're not being kept honest and this is what being taken care of means. So the result of lack of uh, maintenance via lack of inspections is that if these systems aren't uh, inspected, uh, you know, failed treatment, you know, occurs and it doesn't get noticed. So no treatment's happening and nobody notices. And I have uh, four images here. This is one of uh, our separator structures. It's called the downstream defender. Again, you don't need to be particularly familiar with the structure itself just to know that on the left, uh, we have trash. You can see it's filled with trash over uh, several years of not being cleaned. Uh, the next image is uh, of organics of a unit. Uh, that's only after a year, actually. You can see it's sort of, um, there's a sediment storage chamber below what you see here. And there was so much sediment that it, it, it came up above. Uh, and then the third unit, same problem, sediments. You can't see the structure at all because it hasn't been maintained in so many years that it has uh, filled up uh, with, uh, with sediments and dirt. And you can even see that it's causing erosion. Uh, the owners told me that the manhole dances uh, when it rains because uh, the water has nowhere to go, so it shoots up the manhole lid. Uh, and as you can see, it causes, um, causes problems for the overall structure. And then the final image is, this is how the unit's supposed to look. Uh, you know, regardless of size, this is the general makeup of what the unit should look like. So here's a good comparison of trash or, or debris entering the system and when the system's not cleaned. Um, so without continual operational maintenance, BMPs, they're going to stop treating effectively. Uh, on average, it's about a year or two, uh, regardless of, again, the type of unit. If you're, you're talking about LID, uh, structural BMPs, MTDs, it, it doesn't matter. It only takes a year or two. Things stop working. Uh, here's a, a, a catch basin, an alloplast basin. Uh, and you can see here, you know, a lot of times it's very easy to think, okay, you know, look, things are getting in there. It's causing uh, organics, causing algae blooms, or there's trash. We need to get these gross uh, pollutants out like wrappers and, and, and styrofoam containers and things. But it's not always the case. I mean, you see in this particular location, there's a lot of uh, hypodermic needles, uh, obviously uh, an issue a lot of communities are facing. Um, but, um, you know, there's some nasty stuff in here and it doesn't you know, have to fill up the catch basin to, to need to come out. So uh, again, images like this, I kind of pepper through here just to sort of show you this is what we see daily in the field. Uh, now, again, uh, these units, particularly manufactured treatment devices, they go through a lot of rigorous testing. Uh, that's why they're approved and they end up being used in, in, in regional markets. Um, things are tested, you know, uh, TSS, hydrocarbons, organics, heavy metals, maybe, uh, all these different things that they look for. They test how, how do these uh, particular products, filters and separators, et cetera, how do they remove these things? Um, and so a lot of energy, uh, effort, time, money goes into this. The problem is that on the back end, once these things are installed, there is not the same amount of effort or, or, or time or resources uh, available or being put towards making sure that these are actually running the way they were supposed to. So I put in a fun example of, uh, of a pollutant that probably is not tested uh, anywhere uh, prior to approval. You can see here, um, and if you can tell, there's a, a sort of a white powder going into the inlet. What is that white powder? Uh, that's actually, uh, that's flour. Uh, and with the natural yeasts in the environment, uh, this is a, uh, a pizza distribution hub where trucks are delivering flour and raw ingredients to uh, individual restaurants. And uh, inside the filter vault, it is turned into dough with the, the natural yeast. Um, you know, we don't have smell technology yet, but uh, trust me, it's for the best that we don't, uh, do not smell very good in here. Uh, so I'm gonna see, we had to, took quite a while of uh, um, effort to get this out of there. So, you know, Anything can get into the storm lines is the point here. And there's probably a really uh, bad Ninja Turtles joke in here, but uh, I'll refrain from, from making it. But uh, yeah, pizza inside a storm vault. So uh, public awareness is key, of course. A lot of people don't uh, know what stormwater is or what their, you know, what particular types of stormwater structures are. Uh, it's very easy to say out of sight and out of mind uh, if it's an underground system, their structure. Uh, but again, here's another catch basin that's just covered over. It's a graded inlet. You wouldn't even know it's there. Uh, and here's another um, infiltration, uh, uh, 
a green bioinfiltration uh, style system that's, you know, the tree's been broken, no one knows it's there. It's, uh, you know, these are not out of sight, out of mind. These are above ground, and, uh, or at least visually here, and, and no one knows. And uh, a third example being uh, an outlet control structure at a uh, drug detention uh, base, and, and the picture doesn't do it justice. It was behind a, a sort of small jungle to get to. So speaking of ponds, here's a, here's a good case study example. I'll, I'll very quickly go over here. Um, it's 18 months after service of a pond. And so using Google Earth, you can really do some really fun things uh, and, and it's a good visual tool. So you can see here, um, this image is from March of 2012. And then compared on the right, uh, you have September of 2013. So you can see the pond was recently, uh, as of um, 2012, was uh, mowed down and maintained uh, and you know 18 months later it, it's it's overgrown again so this is uh this is actually in maine uh so this is a cold weather area where you know we have winter um far too long throughout the year but if this was the city southeast uh you know this vegetation doesn't stop growing so you'd have to imagine that this would be uh, twice as bad uh with the vegetation dying off in the winter uh, how do you reestablish a pond? Uh, you know, maybe you know, and so sorry if I, you know, but I'm going to explain because a lot of people I talk to, they don't get to always see these things as they happen. Uh, and this is how you reestablish a pond. You flail the, the overgrowth and vegetation. You then have to uh, obviously reestablish the embankments of the basin uh, and, and try to get it back to, to how it looks, reseed grass, etc. cetera. Uh, it takes a lot of work. It doesn't happen in a day. Uh, it's not cheap. Uh, and it's you know essentially a, a construction job. So not routinely mowing and inspecting a detention pond. And again, ponds being one of those structures where you don't need to you know dredge this up say every year. Um, no, you don't. But if you wait a few years, uh, you're going to spend a whole lot more money trying to correct the situation. So I think it's a great example. Uh, you know that that ponds get overlooked very easily, put behind the backs of big box stores or, or uh, you know, hardware stores and, and forgotten about. And it only takes a couple of years for them to, to get really out of shape. So, you know, maintenance isn't happening because inspections aren't happening. So why aren't inspections happening? Uh, resources, uh, lack of manpower or budget. Uh, you know, a lot of municipalities are trying to sort of grapple with this. You know, it takes time to inspect, it takes time to issue notices, it takes time just to go through spreadsheets and files and civil plans and say, what do we have where? and, and you know, who's actually uh, monitoring this. Uh, and so again, you know, a lot of energy and effort goes into the front end of, of these and, uh, and the back end is left wanting, uh, not without good reasons, of course, uh, but you know, I'm hoping here to give some examples of things that can maybe help you come to grasp, uh, grips with that and help you uh, alleviate those issues. Um, so you know, a, a lack of established program to manage sites, it's, it's one of the biggest reasons, um, or a program that isn't sort of working to its full potential. Uh, and the example I give here is again, a dry detention area. Uh, on the left, this is it overgrown. You wouldn't know it was there. And this was it on the right uh, after it had been cleaned up. Uh, this particular site, uh, this detention basin was identified by a third party inspector and a third party contractor came in, uh, a maintenance contractor and, and fixed this. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not always that the city or the local authority will be the one to, to spot these things. Maybe eventually they will, but, um, one of the keys I want to sort of instill is that, you know, uh, rely on, on your local uh, network of engineers and, and, and maintenance providers and let, you know, the private sector help out in, in a lot of these instances. Uh, again, third party identified deficiencies and corrections. Uh, and here's another example of uh, a third party coming in and, and identifying this when otherwise it was unknown. This is an underground detention structure. Detention structure. Um, and so you can see here, this is the same structure I showed you earlier, which didn't look like it had that much sediment after only a year. Uh, after a few more rainstorms, it went up to uh, you know about seven inches. And this is how it had to be cleaned because there was so, many, uh, so much distance between the access manholes that had to be manually shoveled. And as you start shoveling, obviously the, the volume, you start seeing how big that is and it has to be um, vacuumed and power washed out. It's uh, uh, quite the task to clean out uh, even a, a CMP structure like this with only what appears to be uh, a couple of inches of sediment inside. Eventually, this is what we got it to. It took several weeks of work. Again, uh, from the owner's perspective, if you're a specifying engineer, keep in mind that for them, this is something they may not have budgeted for, or if they did, they think, okay, every three or five years. Uh, but 
this is not cheap when it gets to this, and it doesn't take long to get, get this bad. Uh, and so here's another example from that same structure. There were uh, deficiencies identified. You can kind of tell on the far left, uh, there was a gap in the CMP structure. Uh, we were able to uh, use construction grade caulk and, and correct that. Uh, so things like that, that that can be seen, and you'll only see that if you go inside the structure and you start looking around. And a lot of times, uh, you know, municipalities will not be able to uh, uh, have confined space entry. They don't have enough people. Uh, you know, send someone down to the hole and do a substantial inspection like this. And as much as it's great that uh, individual owners can do their own inspections, they can't necessarily do this either. So again. Uh, trying to rely on, on people who have the resources to help identify and correct these is key. Okay, so what, what is working? Uh, what I kind of like to equate this to is um, recycling in the uh, early days, maybe like uh, 40 years ago or so. Um, and I used a, an image of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, how recycling works in a lot of areas today. It's outsourced. Uh, it's, you know, um, private enterprise runs recycling facilities. They service the local municipalities. Uh, and I think something like that could eventually be uh, uh, done with stormwater maintenance. Uh, help from the private sector is really key. Uh, working together with the municipality, working together with the engineer so everyone's communicating. And, and that's one of the things that's lacking. But, you know, imagine if everyone was sort of on the same page and it gets to this point. We're not there yet, of course, but uh, ideally we can get there at some point soon with both inspections, routine corrective maintenance. Um, and there's other things that are also working, such as um, monitoring assistance, certain hardwares and softwares that let you see how things are working in the field. So you don't have to go out until you need to. And, uh, and a really key one that's very interesting that's been uh, just getting better every year is uh, BMP management software. So here's some examples I'd like to share from that. Um, here's a great example of trying to help empower owners uh, by making information easily accessible to them. This is from the uh, St. Louis uh, Metropolitan Sewer District. Uh, they have a great uh, website and program uh, here where uh, all the civil plans have a project number and you can log in, type in your project number, uh, and then you can get your site plan, see what you have. It's very useful um, for owners to, to get educated or to talk to their engineer and help, help them get up to speed. There's a BMP toolbox on their website. Uh, I've talked about this before in a couple other webinars, but uh, I do because it, it's great. And, you know, the more people can see this, I think the better because it's uh, for the average person, there's information here that helps educate you for an engineer or a contractor or somebody who knows more about this. There's information for you as well. It's 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 digestible for, for all parties, uh, regardless of how much you know about stormwater and BMPs. Uh, and there's a whole slew of downloads, uh, checklists, and things like that that you can obtain from there. Uh, one of them being a uh, example report. Now you don't have to use this report in, in the St. Louis metro area, but they give it to you in case you don't know what to start with uh, to conduct an inspection report. So it's very useful. So that brings up the question of who should inspect uh, sites. I think empowering owners to eventually self-monitor and maintain report back on their systems is the ideal outcome that everybody wants. We all want uh, you know, property and site owners, BMP owners to be able to do this. Uh, I don't think we're there yet um, uh, in, in a lot of areas, but here's some areas where it's working. So this is uh, Arlington, uh, Virginia. This is their website, uh, also a great website. And so they list out what you can do, uh, what types of systems, uh, stormwater systems that you can expect to see. Who can perform these inspections? Can the property owner do this? Or do they have to refer to the manufacturer? Or do they require confined space entry and therefore need to hire out somebody to assist in an inspection? Um, so with, you're really sort of saying this you can do yourself, this you'll need assistance with. Here you can go to find more information on who can assist you. Uh, so it's a very, really great website in that way. And the way Arlington works now is that when you fill out your report, you fill it out on their website and each page gets filled out as you, as you go through that as opposed to, to mailing in a, um, a printed report, which you still can do, but the online version is very useful. Uh, so here again, you can break it down by facility type, uh, who can perform the inspections, uh, and, and you know, who can com uh, complete the maintenance. Here's an example from the city of South Portland uh, in Maine. Uh, they require a third party inspector um, to assist in inspecting uh, BMPs. Um, you know, again, empowering owners to eventually do this themselves is ideal. We're not there yet in a lot of places. 
this is a good program because um, it, you know, it sort of mitigates the issues coming from an owner's lack of knowledge about stormwater or a conflict of interest, uh, interest as I mentioned earlier with the, uh, the catch basin with all the material over it. Uh, you, you sort of eliminate that by bringing in a third party to come uh, and, and do these inspections and report back a standardized report for the city. And um, so, you know, South Portland has a list. This is a dated list, um, but they have a list of uh, inspectors. Some of them are engineers. You don't have to be a, uh, a licensed PE to be on the list. Um, but, you know, they, they qualified the, the candidates who'd like to be inspectors and they're put on there. Those are given out to BMP owners so they can uh, seek assistance in helping uh, to conduct inspect and inspections and maintenance. So they, they kind of work with the uh, private sector uh, and the local community so everyone can sort of uh, make sure that these uh, inspections are happening. Uh, this is an example. This is, a, again, a bit of a dated example, but this is the city of uh, Nashville Metro. Uh, and, and they, when uh, sending out notices, uh, will send out a list of here's uh, authorized uh, service providers who can conduct the maintenance and here's the type of maintenance they can conduct. Uh, again, same thing. It's, it's, a great, um, it's a great way to communicate to the property owners. Here's who you can contact to get this resolved. I see a lot of municipalities where they don't give, uh, they don't want to give preference or they don't give any names. They say, you know, find someone and it just drags on the process. So I really recommend being able to list out, here's, here's someone who can help you do this. Um, you know, you don't have to give preferential treatment, but, but list some, uh, some service providers who can really help there. Some cities will actually do cleanings of BMP structures for private owners uh, for a fee, uh, you know, most uh, public works crews aren't really uh, keen on that idea. Um, it's a lot of extra work for them. And sometimes for the city, it can become a, a bit too much work depending on the size of the city to, to take that on. So just another reason to uh, to provide a list of, of folks who can, from the private sector, who can assist with that. And there's a separator cleaning and a, and a pond cleaning as examples. Uh, we did a nice case study. Uh, we did some outreach to uh, the state of New Hampshire. We sent out mailers. Uh, to uh, BMP owners, uh, we got a really big return on, uh, on people who actually uh, opened the email uh, and contacted back saying, I didn't even know I had a BMP, what do I have? Uh, and uh, the point being is that, you know, you can go out and uh, try to get the word out uh, as best you can. At, at the worst case, if someone already knows they have a BMP and they're doing their inspections, they're not going to, um, th they'll ignore uh, the letter, but uh, going out and, and really trying to educate the public that they have something and that they, you know, at least need to be monitoring regularly. Uh, we saw a big return on, on doing that project. And this is a pond here that we identified uh, through doing this program for, for a customer. Uh, and that's, uh, we were able to uh, get it back to uh, the way it should operate for them. So what are some other things that are working besides uh, leaning strictly on the public sector for inspections and or services? Um, one of the things is telemetry and monitoring systems. Uh, we have uh, some, some data logging equipment that we use. Uh, there are a lot on the market as well. We've used them in some specific applications. Uh, we've used them in, uh, we have uh, filtration systems near uh, some large ports. Uh, that are you know, port, authority, port authority areas. And so tides come in making it hard for confined space entry to do maintenance. So we would monitor temperature and tide, see if there was backflow issues. We were able to identify, help optimize the systems operating through that. Um, you know, seeing when there's uh, um, peaks and, uh, you know, cross-checking with uh, rain events to see, you know, our systems, you know, really filtering everything or, or working the way they should. So there's lots of different things you can do. It's simple down to uh, having these devices on site so you know if uh, water levels reach a certain uh, area or a critical area that, you know, you should go personally inspect, okay, is, is something backed up here? Do we need to bring in a, a vacuum truck to, to address this? Uh, I think uh, one, one of the things that's most interesting to me, at least, are uh, software assistance, database management. Um, they can help you automate reports, um, issue notices with one click, send out you know, notices to, to people who haven't sent in their reports, uh, issue reports on what BMPs are being maintained, what aren't. So these are really useful for uh, municipalities, but I'd also argue that large uh, uh, sort of corporate entities could use this as well. If they have multiple locations, you know, think of large national, multinational uh, truck stops or gas stations, things like that. And they have, you know, a wide area they need to cover. They can sort of monitor what of their, you know, what locations are, are up to date. Uh, you can integrate these systems 
with you know GIS system, the really good systems will do this for you. They'll, they'll plug right into the GIS. So a lot of uh, municipalities obviously have GIS systems that they already utilize. You can plug right into that. Uh, so you can sort of share the data you already have. And with some systems, it doesn't have to be limited to stormwater. Other utilities and things can be, can be drawn into that as well. Uh, and, you know, so here's an example of GIS mapping, uh, you know, for the ex uh, example of Washington County, Maryland, uh, you know, shows you here, there's BMPs here, and here's what they do, here's their, their current status. Uh, so imagine being able to, to, to map that into a, a program to let you manage that. Uh, here, this is the Long Creek watershed in South Portland, Maine, uh, and it has all the, the drainage areas separated off, and the same thing, you go in and, and it will show you what's there. So being able to integrate that with the, with the software is, is something very interesting. Um, so uh, here's another example of, of this. So you can see here uh, that you, know, you can have uh, all your information that you need uh, off, of a, off of a dashboard. It can create reports for you. Uh, it can GPS locate things, uh, include photos of where deficiencies are. It will backfill information. So if you are the one conducting the report, uh, you know, you can have all that auto populate when you go out to the field. If you issue this to a uh, you know, public works person or to a, a private owner and say you have to do this, they can access the code and they can uh, have this populate. Um, and so uh, you can see here, um, so this the particular examples from Cloud Comply and, and you can see it will then make a standardized report. So these are the types of things that uh, BMP software management can assist you with uh, in the field. Uh, or in your office, uh, being able to manage the database of locations you have if you're a municipality, uh, or if you're not a municipality, but you know you have a lot of sites that you inspect uh, as an engineer, you can use this uh, same software to automate reports and make things uniform, save a lot of time. Uh, and again, just some examples here, it shows you sort of uh, what gets drawn up and what you can do right off of you know uh, your device. Uh, so, uh, my personal background prior to, to engaging in stormwater, uh, I was involved in archaeology. And so my first storm drain I went in was uh, about 2,000 years old. Um, and you'd be surprised how well Romans uh, maintained uh, their structures. These, these things are still standing. Can't say the same about some of our structures today, unfortunately. But uh, because of that, I, I included a Latin quote here. Sedit qui timuit ne non succederet. Uh, it literally or, or you know, kind of shortly means uh, for fear of failing, he did nothing. So uh, there's, there's a bit of that at play where it's a huge undertaking to try to get uh, get a grasp on, on this problem. If you're a municipality or if, again, if you're a specifying engineer and working with your clients, it's you have a lot on your plate. And this is adding to it, trying to make sure that BMPs are maintained after the fact. But uh, for fear of not doing it well, not doing it at all is, is I. I can't say enough. Don't don't take that mentality. You got to, You have to start somewhere. Uh, so uh, since we have our own maintenance division, here's us. This is us doing the maintenance job um, at one of those ports I had mentioned. Um, you know, we interact by uh, you know researching in our lab and and coming up with um, manufactured treatment devices that separate and filter. Uh, we sell these into the market. We work with regulators and approval agencies. Uh, on my half, I, I work with the maintenance of structures, not just our own, but green systems, non-proprietary systems uh, across the country after they're installed. And, um, you know, we, we try to work together uh, with uh, all the invested parties, such as the BMP owners and engineers and contractors. And what we'd like to do uh, is take one of these um, compliance uh, or BMP management softwares, and we'd like to offer them to a, a municipality that is trying to come to grasps with how they can, uh, you know, better manage their own uh, area. So um, that's one of the things we're, we're hoping to do with this webinar. If you're interested in, uh, in possibly getting a, a, a free uh, annual subscription to one of these softwares, the hope is that um, by helping you uh, sort of get a grasp on what BMPs you have in your area. Uh, helping to educate the owners and, and uh, getting them to comply with maintaining and inspecting their systems. Uh, we can work with you to, to make sure that these things are actually being cleaned out so you don't see the, the issues I've already showed you earlier in the slides. Uh, but again, to start somewhere, um, this is Clayton County, uh, Georgia on the left. Uh, this is a, uh, a sort of maintenance contract that they, they require uh, as part of the permitting process for new properties being developed, where the owner has to say that, yes, I'm going to maintain these structures. 
A similar example on the right, Greenville, South Carolina, at the very least something like this, very simple language, just saying that, you know, we understand that we're taking on this property or we're building this property, we're responsible for the stormwater maintenance. Something as simple as that um, is really a good way to start. Um, so if you're a municipal engineer or regulator, um, you know, coming up with a, a plan or, or a, a form similar to those is, is really a great uh, start to that. So requiring a contract between the, uh, the owner uh, and a local uh, stormwater inspector or uh, um, maintenance provider, uh, you know, make, make the contract be between them. So there's sort of different parties involved. Again, uh, you know, lean on, on, uh, on, on private companies to come in and, and, you know, get a contract with the landowner uh, early so that, you know, there's other people involved in this and now this contract means something. It's not just something that gets filed away in a cabinet and then no one sees it again. Uh, you know, decide if, if your particular area is, you know, based on the types of BMPs you have, can, can the owner do this themselves or do they need a third party inspection? Uh, and I'd argue that you need at least a minimum inspection uh, for, uh, for, for anything to really be effective and, and with photos, of course, uh, require the contracts to be renewed. Don't let them be a one-time thing. Here's, you know, you're about to get your permit of occupancy. Here's your, you know, give us your contract and that's it. No, you have to make sure it's, it's, it keeps on being updated even if that means conducting audits and things. Um, and this is a picture of a, of, uh, a gas station area, which um, this site's actually maintained uh, twice annual. So it's every six months and, and uh, you know, a little bit of oil sheen goes a long way if there's a, a small spill, which is what happened here. But since, uh, since we come here every six months instead of every 12, we were able to get in front of it and get things corrected pretty quick. Uh, so, my point being, depending on the type of uh, structures you have, or the type of area you're in, maybe uh, more than annual, something a little bit more aggressive for, say, places dealing with hydrocarbons, uh, petroleum, and, and gasoline, maybe every six months, but uh, adapted to what you need, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Uh, what else can you do? As I mentioned, utilize GIS under systems you may already have or, or other parts of your city may already uh, be using. Um, you know, make it easy, try to uh, make a one-stop shop with PDF downloads or things like that, uh, access uh, for the public. Uh, you know, I know a lot of, um, you know, municipal folks I talk to, you know, they can end up spending or wasting a whole morning or afternoon just trying to find a file that someone has asked for. And as a public entity, they have to find it. So the more you can kind of get that uh, off your plate, uh, people can help themselves and helps you and helps them. And this is a great example I, I really love, and this is to physically pronounce it. These are examples from northern New York or, or upstate New York. Uh, two examples here. Um, on the left, uh, you have uh, a sign being specified to say that you know, there's a hydrodynamic separator being installed here. So otherwise, no one would know it's there, but now there's a sign there. And on the right, it's the same thing, but it's to say that you know, there's, a, uh, there's a dry pond here, and this, this needs to be maintained. It's not just you know, a, a, a landscaped area this, or, or an overgrown area. A natural vegetation. This is this is very intentional. This is stormwater. And in the middle, there's an example of it uh, in real life. So you know, if you can start um start doing this, start saying you know, if you have an underground structure, you know, you need to put a sign up and put your permit number on it. So you know, owners know you can't claim you didn't know about it if if there's a sign there saying it. Um, so for specifying engineers, if you're not necessarily working in the municipal sector. Um, there's things you can do as well. Ask questions, specific questions. You know, will this work for this installation? Uh, will it also work to, to conduct operational maintenance thereafter? Um, what will the cost of that be? You know, what are the capital costs versus the, uh, uh, the cost of maintaining every year or inspecting every so often? And then, you know, who's responsible for that post-construction? You know, if you're working with the developer and then the property is going to be sold, uh, you know, it's key to work with the municipality and whoever else is involved to say, okay, look, like uh, this needs to then be taken over by by someone else. Whoever inherits this property needs to know about it. At the very least, very often properties change hands and, and people don't know anything about the stormwater. It's the last thing on their minds. And it's really unfortunate, I would say, the horror stories uh, from working in stormwater maintenance would be uh, homeowners associations who get totally blindsided by this, don't have a budget for it don't know what stormwater is in most cases. Uh, and uh, and it, it's really unfortunate. Um, so, you know, the more you can communicate between different parties, uh, the better. And I've seen civil engineers put, you know, a really specific language on plans saying, you know, you need to uh, maintain this once a year and, you know, you can call this number if you need assistance. Uh, you know, municipalities doing the same thing. So, 
uh, yeah, you know, who, who's responsible? We've seen plenty of other sites as well where the uh, the property owner and the tenant just argue over who's responsible for the maintenance. And, you know, and, and without any pressure uh, from the city to, to have the maintenance done or the inspection done, um, you know, nothing really sort of happens without any guidance from the engineer uh, as well. So, you know, the engineers, yeah, maybe don't want to stick your neck out into it too much, but a little bit is actually maybe pretty helpful for you. We work with plenty of engineers who do the inspections themselves for their clients, for uh, sites that they've developed. And then when it comes time to actually maintain these structures, obviously these engineering firms don't have vacuum trucks and things, uh, then they'll work with us and we'll, we'll help them uh, do the cleanings they need. So uh, if you're an engineering firm, you know, you can take, uh, you can take it a step further. Um, and this kind of goes into the uh, private sector thing where, you know, if you're designing sites, you're working with clients, you can take it a step further and you can also conduct inspections and help the owners maintain these sites thereafter and then network with uh, local maintenance providers to, uh, to make sure that the owner's always taken care of. Uh, you know, is there a, an inspection plan in place? Um, who's gonna conduct this, et cetera. Uh, another example I, I like to use, this is out of um, Ohio, uh, uh, out of Columbus, and they've listed the BMPs right there on the first page. These are the BMPs that need to be maintained. Uh, they say what they are, they say when they need to be maintained, how often, where does this need to be reported back to, to the city. It's a very specific language on the civil plans. Uh, I highly recommend doing things like that uh, if, if you're able. So those are things that I think both uh, municipal uh, engineers, regulators, uh, enforcement agencies can do, as well as what uh, specifying engineers can kind of take a step further in their own job and, and, uh, and sort of expand their job role. So everyone's communicating. Because I think the biggest problem is talking to, to property owners, talking to regulators and specifying engineers and contractors, et cetera. Everyone kind of is talking to each other for one thing or another, but no one's all talking together. So the more you can do to communicate more with each other, uh, and then especially the, the end user who kind of gets left out in the dark in most cases, uh, it, it really goes a long way. Uh, and just to go back to that, that example of the homeowners associations, usually it's the residential owners who are most vested in trying to do the right thing. They actually want clean water. Once they kind of understand what this all is, they really do want to do the right thing. And it's unfortunate that they don't have a budget or they, they were unaware. So they're kind of trying to come to grips with how they can do it. You will get, and I won't name names, but you will get plenty of large um, commercial uh, entities that uh, they um, they make they they do very well finding loopholes and ways around ever doing any maintenance at all, um, or the bare minimum, and sort of uh, pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. Um, so that's unfortunate to see. It's not everyone, of course, but um, my point is that you know the more everyone's communicating, the, the the less of that happens. You kind of mitigate the ability for for people to do that. And, and the more positive note is that people who do want to do the right thing, like homeowners, you're really helping them out and getting in front of it. But if you're interested in trash, uh, our next webinar will be on July 17th. Um, it's our fourth annual trash study. Uh, we do a trash cleanup uh, every year at the city of South Portland in the Long Creek watershed here. It's an impaired watershed. Uh, and what we've been doing is this trash uh, cleanup and then we're, uh, we're doing a study on it. So uh, we take it out back to the lab, we weigh the trash, we sort the trash, um, and so we try to come up with some profiles and, and um, a methodology to see sort of what, what we're seeing from cleaning every year. Um, this is from a couple of years ago, but just to kind of give you an idea of what will be in there. I don't want to spoil it because it's actually a really good webinar, but uh, highly recommend it if you're, if you're interested in trash or you want to kind of know uh, what happens or where, where things are going down the storm drain. Uh, here's some photos from it as well. So. Uh, so that's more or less the the webinar. Um, there will be a, an Amazon gift card um, as well. Uh, there's a survey. If you take the survey, you can get the gift card. Uh, winners are notified this week. Uh, we'll make sure that we get you your PDH credits, uh, your certificates if you need that. Um, there should be a survey at the end of this as well. Uh, so if you are a municipal entity and you're interested uh, in possibly getting a, uh, a license or subscription for a year for a uh, BMP management software that will help you uh, report, uh, will help you issue notices, help you manage uh, where things are and what they are, um, you know, you'll be able to, uh, to identify yourself there. Or if you have any other questions and things like that, um, you can also uh, uh, contact me. This is my information here. 
Um, I would say the majority of the time I spend um, is actually educating people on what their stormwater is, what they need to do or what they should do, what's the best practice, those sorts of things. Um, it, because it's still really unknown to people outside our circle, I think. So um, if you have questions, uh, you wanna know more about some of the slides I put up, uh, you wanna see them, I can send you more information on them, show you some programs I've seen across the country that I think work well in their particular area, maybe even be able to connect you with some people who I know in some of those areas if you'd like, if I'm able. Um, you know, I think as long as everyone's talking about this and communicating, it, it's really the, the best way to do this. Uh, knowledge is, is truly power in this instance where the more we all kind of know what's going on, the better. So if I can uh, give you any particular slides or other information, by all means, please let me know. Uh, and other than that, I will say uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I hope you all have a good summer. And if you are in Minneapolis or Atlanta, I'd love to see you at the uh, next presentations, which will be different than this, um, but uh, always talking about maintenance and uh, the hurdles therein. Thank you.